Uh, really quickly, Friends of Mirror Meeting Bay uh, uh, is unique in that we do a lot of research stuff, uh, unique, some unique projects, and, and represent, representing what I have to say, we'll have some of these trifolds up on, I guess they're just on the table tonight here. Uh, we've done some great research projects, worked some with Bowdoin College in the past, some on our own. Um, we're a land trust, protected over 1,500 acres of land around the bay, uh, predominantly wetland areas or wetland associated, and we just finished up a four-year, $600,000 project protecting what has been described as the largest, uh, or not the largest, the, uh, the most important prehistoric archaeological site in the state of Maine. And uh, it's a little bit ironic, I thought about this the other night, a lot of the work we do is about safe and effective fish passage, getting fish past dams that are in the river. Maine, as you know, has a large hydro industry, so the dams block the fish and that can uh, harm them either on the way up or on the way down if they go through the turbines particularly. But uh, this site that we just protected uh, was probably the site of a Native American fishing village because at lower sea levels a long time ago there were either some major rapids or a waterfall or some combination over the course of the years between 4,500 and 9,000 years ago that essentially dammed the river or, or blocked fish passage. So. We're in court now in an endangered species action uh, suing the, the owners of the lower seven dams on the Androscoggin and the Kennebec and we just protected an old uh, site that was there because it impeded fish. So look for future friends to maybe protect the junkyard next to the Pajepscot Dam in Topsom, who knows, you know? So. Anyway, so land trust and we have an active education program. We do all this with volunteers and uh, one staff person who I'd like to introduce who's right behind the camera at the moment, uh, Jeff uh, DeRosa, who's a new executive coordinator for us. Uh, if you're interested in helping us with any project, we love it. There's some great archaeology that's going to happen this summer as they uh, replace the Richmond Bridge over the Kennebec and we'll be working with the Maine Historic Preservation Commission to do that. Uh, We'll have a premier uh, outdoor education event for school children uh, May 22nd in Woolwich, uh, Bay Day. They're doing all kinds of fun, really hands-on, get dirty activities and uh, it's just a wonderful spot and a super location. We'd love your help if you're interested. So land trust, uh, research, education and advocacy. I mentioned the Endangered Species Act suit. That's just one of the things that we're involved with. And Nate is eyeballing back there. Uh, a poster that I brought in. You could bring that on up, sir. Um, it's actually a poster showing all of the dams in the state of Maine and it's kind of like a pox upon the state. Uh, hard to see from too far away but all these little black things are dams and depending on whose database you use there's, there's probably you know high 600s to 900 dams in the state of Maine. Uh, some percentage of those being hydro, a, a small, a fairly small percent. I think it's probably it's probably, I don't know, you would know better than I probably, but 20% maybe, yeah. you know, so, so anyway. So Nate, a uh, good friend, uh, has been on our board, the Friends of Miami Bay Board, for many years. And he's also uh, been a fishery restoration biologist at the Department of Marine Resources for about 20 years. Uh, before that, he was uh, doing fish biology with the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. And he's a graduate in uh, fish ecology from Unity College here in Maine. So it's a pleasure to welcome Nate and I'll point out now and, and maybe again at the at the time of the drawing we have one event left in this series it's May 8th second Tuesday in May it will be at the Maine Maritime Museum and it will be Captain Paul Watson who many of you may know his name from if you have cable TV and watched Animal Planet program Whale Wars has been on TV but he directs the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society. We're very excited to have him. They're known for putting themselves between Japanese whalers and uh, the whales. And they have campaigns not only in Antarctica, but in the Mediterranean and the Faroe Islands and different places. And uh, it should be a wonderful talk and uh, look forward to seeing you there. So, Nate, you all studied up? I'm all studied up. <laughs> It's really a remarkable thing 
being at this job as long as I've been at it and getting used to seeing all these dams. Excuse me. Nate, Go ahead. If, if you're not going to use the mic, you really need to speak up. It's really kind of... Thank you. Right. <laughs> and you can pull that mic out if you want. It's, yeah. just, it's just sitting in there for now. You can take it right out of the holder and carry it around with you. All right. This map, it really doesn't do it justice. There's a lot more dams than are shown that are on this map. This map doesn't even cover a quarter of them. Uh, virtually every watershed in the state of Maine that had any level of gradient to it was dammed throughout history from the time the first Europeans settled here. Uh, and essentially that was just as it implies power the power to make material, to run shingle mills and sawyers and grind your grain. These were all methods of commerce for the state uh, and for the people that lived in these small towns long prior to statehood. In fact, I was just at a dam uh, two days ago uh, up on Flanders Stream just outside Sullivan uh, that was a relic of late 18th century uh, woodcutting. Uh, built on a very small watershed, but virtually all of these watersheds, if there was any any heights to it at all, got a dam. Um, and we're dealing with that today as far as fisheries restoration. And I'll get into this presentation. We kind of always poke fun at PowerPoint presentations because they're so incredibly boring. Uh, but this one really isn't too terrible boring, and I'll show you why. We'll get into it here a little bit. Uh, this is a seal pup, a weanling that showed up uh, at Benton Falls on the Sebastocook River. Benton Falls is now the first dam uh, on the Sebastocook River. This is one of a pair of seals that arrived there. Now this is about 70 miles from salt water. Now this animal, along with its, probably its sibling, who wasn't in this photograph, followed these, these fish, these alewives, uh, 70 miles upstream in order to take advantage of them. And uh, take advantage they did because collected below the dam was this enormous school of fish. And so the, the, the seal that you're looking at spent oh, about five minutes fishing and 23 hours and 55 minutes sleeping uh, every day. Uh, essentially it would eat its fill and, and uh, it and its sibling would haul out on the rocks and, and uh, sunbathe, for lack of a better term, and then go back to fishing. All right, as uh, Ed implied, I've been with the department for 20 years. When I first started, uh, we were into uh, basically the, what amounted to the beginning of the Kennebec River restoration program, or close enough to the beginning that we can call it that. Um, and it started, you know, with a management plan back in June of 1982. Now, I didn't come on with the department until 92, but it takes a while to get some inertia running in any sort of program, uh, particularly one that was this ambitious. And it started, uh, strangely enough, kind of with striped bass, which had been long since uh, gone or reduced to very small numbers within the rivers and uh, a restoration program for striped bass and that morphed in turn into a much larger broader restoration program that encompassed river herring uh, which included the alewife and the blueback uh, you know the striped bass uh, getting a good feel for what we had for a sturgeon population because we knew they were there uh, we'd seen them we'd caught them uh, smelt uh, lamprey uh, there's a whole long list, and you notice one fish that I haven't listed yet was the Atlantic salmon. There's been a long record with the state working particularly in the Penobscot Basin on the restoration of Atlantic salmon. And the reason for that is not ecological. It's socio-economic for the restoration of Atlantic salmon. Uh, Atlantic salmon is an apex predator uh, occurring in relatively small numbers in any of the main river systems. In fact, some would argue that the Atlantic salmon didn't even show up on United States shores probably until about 1500, shortly after the, the uh, mini ice age. Okay? But salmon has always been referred to, Atlantic salmon has always been referred to as the king's fish. 
It is still the king's fish. And much attention was paid to that particular one species alone in its restoration. Meanwhile, the other ten species of diadromous fish that we possess in this state languished. And in some cases continue to languish. So, we'll get into it a little deeper. Those are some of the species we've been working on right here. Uh, river herring, which you all men already mentioned, American shad, striped bass, rainbow smelt, Atlantic sturgeon, uh, getting them back to their historic range within the Kennebec Basin. Now, principally river herring, we've been looking at the Sebastopol River Basin, which also happens to be the largest tributary, tributary to the Kennebec River system. And it comprises a large network of fairly great ponds that were once historically accessible and we know this because there's enough of a written historic record of the presence of these fish and in fact if you dig a little deeper there's an unwritten written record as well in the form of these Indian villages that dotted the shores of the Kennebec and the Sebastocook and the Cobbesee drainages uh, for 9,000 years prior to the contact period with the Europeans and you can still find remnants of weirs. In fact, I wish I had some pictures of them, but there's a lot of weirs that are relatively still visible that are hundreds, perhaps thousands of years old. In fact, some of them are thousands of years old, scattered throughout the basin. And that's another indicator of the once prolific fisheries resources that occurred within the Kennebec Basin, as well as most of other, the other main rivers that didn't have giant tidal falls associated with them or great falls that the fish just couldn't get past. This is the major boring part. It gets better, I, I promise. But this is to give you kind of a background. Uh, the operational plan for the restoration of shad and alewives. And obviously, the goal is to restore shad and alewives. Uh, this is principally what I've been doing for the past 20 years, is working on one river and one sub-drainage within one river to restore this population. And so far we've done pretty good with the money that we've had. And we've come a long way, let's just say, since when I first started where we had this vestigial population of river herring that were all confined below Edwards Dam in the head tide in Augusta and could no longer reach their natal spawning ground. So you had alewives mixed with shad, mixed with blueback herring, mixed with sturgeon, mixed with striped bass, everybody just kind of milling around below this dam. Uh, and this is one unique feature about the Kennebec River Basin that most of the other river basins in the state don't enjoy, and it happens to be Merrimeeting Bay. These relic populations had some place to hide somewhat. When you look at the Penobscot and you get up to Bangor, it's a straight shot, and the saline wedge goes well up into the river, so there's very little available spawning habitat. Merrimeeting Bay acted as a sort of buffer, a biological life raft that allowed these fish to kind of cling on here in the river system. Most of the other river systems in the state do not enjoy that. And that's one of the reasons that we had as many fish to work with in the beginning as we did. So, objected to achieve an annual production of 6 million alewives above Augusta and 725,000 shad. I can tell you for a fact that the first objective we will achieve shortly. The second objective is far more ephemeral. Shad are very difficult to work with and one thing I've learned in the past 20 years is how to kill fish and shad are easy to kill. We've worked with the Shad Hatchery Program with a very bright and ambitious man in Waldeboro by the name of Sam Chapman and we've raised gobs and gobs of shad, uh, spawned them in a tank, essentially, you know, wild fish in a tank and got the resultant eggs, incubated them, hatched them out, fed them on brine shrimp, marked them with oxy oxytetracycline so that we could get these fish back if we captured an adult and it happened to die somehow, because we're certainly not targeting these fish as a commercial fishery, we could extract the otolith and see if it was a shad hatchery produced fish. We have no idea the actual shad population right now in the Kennebec. Suffice it to say that there are thousands upon thousands. That's as far as I'm going to go. When we started, we had below Edwards hundreds and hundreds. 
So, first objective, we're rapidly approaching that mark. At Benton Falls last year, the population of river herring as a whole was well in excess of 3 million. We actually counted, physically counted, 2.75 million. Okay, the fishery accounted for a great deal less than that. There was a commercial fishery, but it was well over a half million adults were captured as part of the fishery. So we're well beyond the three million mark as it stands now. Uh, production of shad, the trending right now, and this is based totally on qualitative observation by some dedicated anglers, a growing group of anglers that are targeting, the, targeting these shad. Anybody know what a shad looks like? It looks just like an alewife, but you magnify it five times. They're much, much larger. They're kissing cousins to the alewife, but they're very much larger than an alewife. The world record was 12 and a half pounds out of the Connecticut River. Mostly what we see in the Kennebec is, you know, males and females averaging three and a half to six pounds. Okay, so they're the world's largest herring species, American shad are. Anybody has a question, just raise your hand and I'll do my best to answer it. Yeah. Well, there's a shad right here, at least a shad head. It's, it's pretty dead. These fish are, uh, uh, are very remarkable in, in many ways. Uh, most of them don't become sexually mature until they're five years old and they enter the river system much like they're cousins do, the alewife, uh, to spawn except for their main stem spawner. They're not traveling up to these ponded areas, these lakes and small ponds to spawn. They stay in the main stem and spawn right in the main stem and uh, the resultant larvae kind of drift downstream and then the eggs hatch out in a few days and then they kind of you know go with the current as basically plankton uh, and finally they get enough weight on and after about 30 days, 35 days, 40 days, they metamorphose into their adult form and then they become self-determined. Prior to that, they were at the whim of the current, the tidal and the regular main stem current. And once they become kind of, you know, self-determined, they actually head back upriver as juveniles looking for the good feeding lanes so they can get big and fat prior to heading out to sea. All right, I was talking about the uh, Sebastopol and here it is. If it's in red, we're not in it. If it's in blue, we are. So the production you're seeing on the Sebastocook uh, is basically uh, everything upstream of China Lake. And I'll come around and kind of point it out. And I'll yell when I'm away from the microphone. Hmm. Benton Falls is right here. Fort Halifax used to be right here. It came out in 2008. I'll show you some pictures here in a little bit. So the count, 2.751 million adult river herring were counted here last year. Benton Falls didn't, or uh, Fort Halifax did not come out until late 2008. Prior to Benton Fall, or Fort Halifax coming out, everything that happened in the Sebastopol Basin except for two years was done by truck. All the stocking was done by truck. Everything was done by truck. The fish were loaded, I'll start at the beginning, in Edwards Dam into a tank, sorted into the truck to make sure we weren't carrying any nasty things, which I'll tell you all about later, and then trucked from Augusta to Unity Pond, from Augusta to Sebastopol Lake, from Augusta to Pleasant Pond, from Augusta to Douglas Pond, okay? Back and forth, back and forth. As fast as we could go with the crew that we had, which usually amounted to about five people with two trucks, we could move about 100,000 fish in a season. That's seven days a week, 12 hours a day for seven weeks. Minimum. That's as fast as you can go. Fast as we could capture the fish and actually physically move them. And we used basically what amounts to a giant vacuum cleaner to capture the fish. It's called a transvac. It's been highly adopted by the uh, commercial fishing industry now, but it actually came from the agricultural industry to move tomatoes and oranges with water medium so they wouldn't bruise them. Okay, and it got adapted to the fishing industry for commercial movement of fish between boats, holds, and the dock. Slurry of water and a big vacuum vessel, whole boat, yay big around, and yay tall, about a 16 horsepower electric pump and it evacuates the air from the chamber and the chamber pulls the vacuum and sucks the fish in, the flappers close, it pressurizes the chamber and pushes the fish to the top without hurting them, in theory. Okay, so 
Any questions on the greater Sebastopol Basin here and where we're at? Good. Here's your basic anatomous life history. If you erase the species on the side, and the three to five years in salt water, basically you get just about any anadromous species. And you can plug in years or remove years as you see fit and it will describe the species. We have 11 of them. Diadromous species. Okay. They use diadromy only to account for the American eel, which is truly catadromous. It doesn't spawn in fresh water, it spawns in the salt water. It has the exact opposite life cycle as the anadromous species. So we use diadromy to describe both life cycles. But here you have the anatomist life history of, let's say, the alewife, or it would account for the shad as well. Um, but the adults will enter fresh water uh, to spawn typically in the springtime when temperatures are rising as they are now, as the fish are now, as we speak, coming in to the estuary from the Gulf of Maine to swim up river to spawn. And then they spawn. The alewives typically head for the ponds, that's where they come, although they will have some limited spawning in the slower moving stretches of the river, which accounts for Merrimeeting Bay and why we had a population left over to begin with. Same thing with the shad. Blueback herring uh, spawn in the faster, shoaler water of the river, not quite so deep and quite so slow as the American shad do. Here's your life history in words. They live from, you know, about four to nine years old. We do get repeat spawners here. They become sexually mature at a minimum of four years old. And we like to see lots of repeat spawners on these runs. Maine's one of the few states remaining on the eastern seaboard that actually has a commercial river herring harvest. Now, there is a petition to list the species, river herring, collectively, blueback herring and alewives, okay? A federal listing that would effectively shut down all the directed fisheries, the municipalities, from harvesting these fish. And in a minute, you're going to see why. So they range from Newfoundland and North Carolina, okay, a tremendous range for a particular species. These are three herring right now on the screen that you see before you. Uh, as a fisheries biologist, one of the cool things I get to do is go and do field work and capture these fish in the river. Those are three separate species there. They are not the same. The top one is an alewife. The middle one is a blueback. The bottom one is an American shad, yet they're all identical in size because they were all born this past year. So you'll quickly learn to pick those fish out of a crowd and identify them. Trust me, it takes a while. The importance of alewives, lives, we've touched on it a little bit, and we're going to touch on it quite a bit more here in a second. Important prey fish for coastal and inland fish species. It sounds pretty boring, it reads pretty boring, but I can't tell you how dynamic this really is, how real it is. I was at the uh, NRCS, which is one of the moving branches of the USDA in the state of Maine, and they had a piece of literature there talking about small farms in Maine and how well over 90% of all the farmed land in Maine is considered small. And I read a little bit further, I was waiting for audience with one of my funders working on a project, and I read on a little bit further and it said, Small farms in Maine, now you've got to remember this is coming from the federal government, but this is important. Small farms in Maine are considered to be an integral part of national security. Think about what that really means. It's happened before in history and it will surely happen again where at some point you cannot go to Hannaford, you cannot go to Walmart. You cannot go anywhere but where you are. And that's when local food supply becomes the difference between being very hungry or just, you know, the 
point they were trying to get across is these local food supplies are extremely important because they come to you they're already there you know versus you having to go get them or them being shipped you know iceberg lettuce from California blah 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 so I read that and thought huh you know this is the one piece of literature I haven't seen from the fisheries end of things you know the commercial fisheries end of things and I'll show you a graph here in a second that basically echoes what I just said how important these fisheries are and if, if you haven't heard this before and you're hearing it for the first time now pay attention because I'm not the first one to say it many before me have said it Atkins back in the 1860s the first commissioner's reports to the you know to the state Stringer and Rounce fell in the mid 1940s during World War II where they were worried about food supply and us now we're saying it again and again we're repeating ourselves okay because we're seeing the same problem manifest itself year after year again and again over the decades and in fact centuries the depletion of these common resources in the ocean these fisheries and the last bullet point here the alewives are good for lobster bait anybody ever eaten an alewife? they're actually pretty good bony but good you know for the inexperienced it's like eating a fish flavored screen door <laughs> uh, for those that know what they're doing they make delightful table fare and excellent accompaniment to beer all right this is kind of a general cascade a very general cascade because you've got to remember I'm an ecologist and each of the frames that follows you're going to see some animals that directly associate in a predator-prey relationship with alewives directly there'll be some surprises but not many and it is a short list didn't have room in the PowerPoint to include them all but you got your typical national symbol okay if you come to Benton Falls this spring you'll see one of the state's largest aggregation of bald eagles if not the largest by a long shot Osprey, off the scale, great blue herons, cormorants, kingfishers, the gulls, even mallards eat them with gusto if they can corner them. Mergansers, hooded mergansers, common loons, and black ducks also with gusto. Fur bearing mammals, we've already looked at one, but there are plenty that will actively chase and eat alewives are they available particularly in stream sections when the fish get compressed down into a smaller second or third order stream they will be readily preyed upon by a multitude of fur bearing mammals and weasels will go after them they all go after them in fact last year we were watching the video monitor and you can see that river otter on the upper right hand side that's not my picture I don't have much time to take pictures while I'm at work but we do get a few and I'll show you some in a bit we had a river otter uh, playfully chase a school of alewives right into the trap at Benton Falls and look around its iron enclosure decided it didn't like it and it boogied back out of there and hung out below in the river for quite a while but we regularly see some pretty amazing stuff up there humpback whales eat them, harbor porpoises eat them, harbor seals eat them, finback whales eat them, anything that can catch them will eat them I've joked often enough but it's absolutely true the alewife has a job in life and its job is to be eaten there's a reason why one female will produce over a hundred thousand eggs and that's because the attrition rate for the young is extraordinarily high and even after they get past that stage and they're not quite so young it's still extraordinarily high it's only when they achieve full adulthood that they stand much of a chance of fleeing much of anything you know because everything's after them Atlantic cod we're getting into the fish end of things now things that are directly tied to alewives uh, Ted Ames uh, a researcher and a McCarthy Genius Award winner has uh, done some pretty convincing tying of the Atlantic cod nearshore spawning populations to 
ill-wife populations and the collapse of the ill-wife populations and the subsequent collapse of the nearshore spawning cod populations. Now you don't have to be a rocket science to understand how that works. You know, it's fairly straightforward. You take away the food, you close McDonald's, nobody goes to buy hamburgers anymore. You know, you take away the resource and predators don't go there anymore. And one of the things we found, uh, remarkably enough, but it bears stating here, is that fish have memory. They remember where things are, particularly older fish, particularly striped bass. In fact, when we first started reestablishing the fishery in Weber Pond at Vassalboro, Maine, uh, it was only a couple of years after the juveniles had been pouring out of the Seven Mile Stream system back into the main stem Kennebec, and we'd show up there long before the juveniles started coming out because they do a controlled water quality drawdown there, i.e., I know exactly when the fish are going to show up, and they're not there yet, but there's this huge crowd of striped bass waiting at the outlet. Okay? We first started seeing this back when we were stocking Pleasant Pond in Cobbacy. These giant fish would show up and just hang out, waiting for something. Well, the truth of the matter is they know what's coming. They know that soon the smorgasbord will be there, and they're just going to hold in that position until it's feeding time, and the fish come out. So they do remember, just like the Atlantic cod remembered where to be and when to be there. So they'd follow these populations in and wait and then eat them. Bluefish, haddock, American eel, swordfish, these have all been documented to eat river herring. These fish are all directly tied to this great resource. Landlocked salmon eat them, brook trout eat them, chain prickle eat them, white perch eat them. Yellow perch, largemouth bass, smallmouth bass, red breast sunfish, goes on and on and on. Okay, to the meat of the matter. Main alewife landings. Not a very good graph. Graphs are pretty boring. But what you see is the catch in millions of pounds, and then you see the effect of the fisheries and lack of access. Now, you look back at that graph and it only goes back to 1950. Much prior to 1950, we didn't have a very good idea, a very good grasp on what the commercial fisheries were doing as far as denting the population of alewives. Not that that matters much because of this. You were already dealing with the effect of all these coastal dams, okay? Prior to there being any good record keeping. You see all sorts of reference to, going back to the colonial period, these enormous runs of fish. In fact, it was a, a sales point to move people over here from Europe. Come to the New World. We got tons of everything. The dams started going in, the population started to plummet. Okay? Nobody has a really good idea, and it's very difficult to look in the rearview mirror of history and extrapolate what the sizes of these populations really were. But we have a pretty good idea based on available habitat and what we know can occur for recruitment within a particular sized habitat. Because we can count. And that's what we've done on the Sebastocode. Anybody have any idea? Quick, go ahead, John. So these data are all from group uh, landings and rivers and nothing like offshore? No, nothing offshore. These are all, you know, no, go ahead, Steve. What's the two-day and the three-day and the three day closure? All right, so the uh, commercial fisheries, the directed commercial fisheries in Maine, these are all municipal fisheries. These aren't boats. These are weirs set up in rivers to intercept these fish on their way to their spawning grounds. Now, when things first started out, you had like a one-day closure, closure with the municipality. This, is a, this goes back a long ways. This goes back to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts where the powers that be, today it's the Commissioner of Marine Resources, will grant the municipality the right, the ownership of these fish with certain caveats. Two-day closure that happened back in you know, 1987 uh, 
Prior to that, there was a one-day closure. So you could fish six days a week. And one day, you had to allow for escapement so that you had adults getting back up into the natal headwaters where they could spawn and you could start the population again. And you see, you know, the trending on the, on the, the graph, you know, still declining. So people started to get a little bit nervous. So they went to a three-day closure, which is where we're currently at now. So what we're seeing principally is a slow climb back to the, you know, the, the levels of the, you know, the 70s and, the, you know, the 50s. What we're trying to do is get back to some higher number. But the long and the short of it is this. Again, you can't help but go back and look. You go to any of the major main stem streams and rivers on the coast of Maine, what you still find, if they're not active, we have a combination of relic dams and active dams. The vast majority of them are relic. And I challenge you, you know, from my standpoint, working on restoration to go to a pond association, well, just put it this way. Tell them you're going to take out their dam and watch what happens. So it's a combination of cajoling and, and working with them. We do a lot of fish passage installation, which is virtually most of these runs go through some sort of fish passage. There's very few that are open systems. St. George being one. Go ahead. So what happened in 1980? Really nothing, you know, other than the trending downward, you know. So you can't explain that kind of average, you know, somewhere around, say, two million pounds down to an average of half a million pounds? Yeah, you could, you, you could look at it and say, you know, the results of these closures, you know, are having some effect, but at the same time, uh, there's the cause and effect, particularly in fisheries ecology, can be greatly extended temporally. And I'll give you a good example of that. The lobster fishery. Okay? The lobster fishery, as far as catch, is going up and up and up and up and up. But effort is relatively flat lined. What you're seeing is an echo of something that's happened over the past 200 years where we've basically gone out and annihilated all the apex predators that worked with cod, you know, striped bass, you know, big codfish will gobble down one lobster after another if they can get on top of them, you know, all these, you know, all these, you know, halibut, you know, all these things that used to eat lobster are no longer there. So slowly, lobster recruitment is going up and up and up. There'd be plenty that would argue with me. For the most part, it's pretty true. How else do you explain this? You know, this this ever climbing, you know, return on lobsters. Meanwhile, the rest of the commercial fisheries, pick one, one of the commercial fisheries off the coast of Maine. Pick any one and I'll show you a decline. Cod, haddock, winter flounder, scallops, clams, any one. So we're constantly pecking away, driving, you know, you don't, you, all you have to do is read the newspaper to see it. All these fisheries are getting, you know, either strictured somehow, Atlanta carrying one of the most prolific species on the face of the planet, shrimp, you know. Okay, they're, they're clamping down on all these fisheries because the effort has gotten so high that now you're starting to you're starting to affect the overall population's ability to rebound from these hits it's been taking. Any more questions on this boring graph? All right, we talked about it a little bit prior to what it bears looking at. What you're seeing up until 2006 would be what you can do with a truck and a crew. Like I said, seven days a week for about six or seven weeks. Seven, you know, 12, 14, 16 hour days. That's how many you can move. Roughly about 100,000 fish. 
suddenly in 2007 and 2008, you know, miracle of miracles, they allowed us to bail directly from the receiving tank at Fort Halifax into the head pond because we had installed fish passage or Benton Falls Associates had installed fish passage as well as Burnham Hydro. So they had activated fish lifts, fish lifts that were ready to operate. And we also had installed fish passages at Sebastopol Lake, Plymouth Pond, Pleasant Pond. All these places had fish passage. Unity Pond was open. Okay. If we went back to the map, you look at the west branch of the Sebastopol, which encompasses Great Moose, Big and Little Indian Pond. We're still into only about 45% of the basin. The rest of it is closed off. Some places we'll never get back to, Wasakeg. We know there was a fish run at Wasakeg, but literally the outlet stream of Wasakeg and Dexter runs underground for a quarter mile. The town is built on top of the stream. So 2007 and 2008, we could bail about 600,000. That is a crew of people working seven days a week, about 12 to 14 hours a day, bailing with a net from the tank into a flume that dumped into the head pond so the fish could continue their migration upstream. Some strange effects can occur when you're doing something like that because you've got to remember these fish, they don't all show up at once at the dam. They show up in kind of a cascade. The older fish, typically show up first. We're not sure why, but we'd like to think it's experience. So they show up first, but you can always bail so fast, and the pump can only pump so fast. And the pump literally has a hole about like that. So there's your lottery right there. As an alewife or a blueback herring or whatever you happen to be swimming, you must find and be under this ring when the vacuum cycle turns on high boost. If you're not there, then you don't get to move upstream. So in 2007 and 2008, we moved about 600,000 fish per year. Now, in late 2008, Fort Halifax comes down, which by the way, this was supposed to occur in 2002. And the reason why is what we just alluded to a while ago. If I come up and tell you we're going to take your dam out, there's going to be a fight. And there was. And it lasted six years. In the end, they lost. But it was one of the mo most remarkable citizen-based efforts to retain the dam that we've seen to date. Okay? A very, very small vocal group of people, save our Sebastopol, basically stopped FPL, Florida Power and Light, which is now Next Year Energy, from removing the dam, from doing what they wanted to with their own property because they were on the hook legally to either install fish passage or remove the dam. They opted to remove the dam. SOS came in and basically you know, started a suit against the state and FPL, and they kept that dam in for six years. Now, in 2008, it comes out. In 2009, what you're seeing is as four-year-olds, you know, you're looking at, you know, back to 2004 or so. Those are the resultant recruits, 1.5 million. In 2010, you're up to 1.75 million. Now, in 2007, those are the recruits that make up your 2011 component. So roughly 600,000 fish bought three million. Go ahead. Why did people want the Fort Halifax dam to come out? Well, I can boil it down to several talking points. First talking point, I don't like change. Nobody does. Anybody that says they do is a liar, for the most part. Okay? People are very inured with their impoundments. They like them. They're recreational opportunities. They had a good population of largemouth bass. They were fun to fish for. And yes, there was bald eagles wheel wheeling around. You know, also, you know, to get to the politically astute stuff, this is a domestic source of power. Okay? And we all seen, you know, what's happening in the Middle East, and that, that rings true with anybody. You know, this is a power supply that's domestic, that we make here, that's homegrown. It's not supporting some radical faction over someplace, you know, blah, 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 you know. 
They said just about anything. And basically, they bought six years of my time in the restoration's time. Uh, you know, for six years, they, they stymied up the works. So, when you look at the graph, you can see exponential. Go ahead. So at the beginning you said that there were 600, I think you said there were 600 or 900 dams in the state, maybe more. Oh, like grossly that. more than that. Yeah. Quite a few. Yeah. So the, this is a pretty persuasive chart here. Mm -hmm. We see the nail work going up, that's a pretty persuasive chart. But even so, would you say that every dam should come down? No. Okay, and which ones do you think should be saved or left? Hydro. Power. Well, the one you just took down was hydro. Right. Okay, so what was your balancing out of that? There is no balancing. Okay, why? Well... I mean, surely it isn't just a ration. There must be a reason to... Right, it, 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 that, 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 that wasn't a choice of the state. The state did not demand that the dam came down. That was an agreement between FPL and the state that you will install a fish passage, period. And you have a choice. You can either install fish passage through the installation of a mechanism that moves fish, or you can remove the blockage. Well, but you just said that not every dam would need to come down. No, they need effective, safe passage upstream and downstream. Are you determining based on the number of eel life in it or some other fish in it? I mean, what are the criteria you do yourself would use to determine this dam ought to come down, right, this one ought not to? You're trying to achieve some level of ecological function in the river, okay? Which basically, once you make it above Lockwood in Augusta, the river no longer functions ecologically. It's essentially been so highly modified, it'll harbor species, make no mistake, but as its original intention, call it the creator, if you will, it harbored this enormous population of other species as well that were extirpated. Why well, do we need any of them? I just don't understand your criteria. Well, I just don't know in general. Oh, were I to have my way, if I had a mandate, you know, but I don't have a mandate. We operate under a political system, you know. And these, you know, the main stem, most of the main stem dams do generate an enormous amount of power for the state, you know. Getting rid of those is possible. In fact, it happened. We were the first state to do it. It certainly is possible. Right. The other option is you in install effective upstream and downstream passage. Okay. Now, when we talk about effective upstream and downstream passage, what we're looking at is some percentile of the run. Generally speaking, rule of thumb, grab it out of the air, is 95%. 95% of the fish that show up at the base of the dam that want to move upstream should be able to move upstream in a relatively short period of time and on the downstream side of things, relatively the same, 95% effective downstream passage. 